Well, I think we're about ready to begin. If you'd please take your seats. Continue to pass your questions to the center aisle. And we'll begin by asking if the members of the panel uh, have any questions or observations about the Pollock's talk. Dr. Callahan? Well, uh, over the past couple of years, I've seen reports in this country, many scientists and others saying, really switching the emphasis from the clinical benefits of stem cell research to the knowledge benefits, which I think has been a rather interesting shift because initially it was all introduced as the regenerative medicine, the saving lives. But, but, but I've seen more now reports of seeming to downgrading that aspect and talking more about knowledge as if the clinical problems are more daunting uh, than originally thought. Um, I think in, in life you get um, a great excitement of anything happening, mm -hmm. and then when there are problems, you get terribly depressed, and then you come back to normal life, which is a combination of disappointments and uh -huh. excitement. And I say, I think the field is maturing and people are realizing we need to learn much more mm -hmm. on the science and avoid the hype, but we need to have hope. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are surprises like uh, an engineer bladder that lasted for eight years in children. Mm -hmm. So it's moving, not as the pace it was thought in the early days mm -hmm. and not on the pace that we thought it will never happen. So first, they said, this is madness. Then they said, great, cures everything. Then I'm not going to give it even to my dog. And now I said, well, maybe one day. <laughs> Dr. West? Yes, yeah, so in engineered tissues for transplantation, there have been some remarkable successes, like the skin replacement products, success in some cartilage applications. And yet some of the more pressing issues like tissue engineering a heart, a liver, a kidney have remained more daunting. And I was wondering if you could just comment for the audience why some tissues have been much easier to engineer than others. Um, I can comment on the challenge of differentiation. So it's easy to differentiate um, ectoderm, the outer layer, uh, which also involves the skin and, and the brain, and um, the middle layer, the mesoderm, like bone, not too bad. Then you go to the inner organs, the endoderm layer, and it's, it's quite difficult to uh, differentiate like um, liver or lung, uh, but it's happening slowly. They don't uh, move at the same pace, as far as I am aware. And in terms of um, uh, tissue engineering organs that we can implant, we need to consider that we, will they engraft, will the blood vessels we take in, will the innervation take in, and will they have nutrients there. So th there are challenges that we need to uh, be aware of. Dr. Aaron? Um, Yesterday, I was uh, stumbled onto a conversation between a couple of people based here at Gustavus. Uh, one was a fundraiser who was uh, somewhat surprised because uh, a potential funder had uh, posed the question, well, what would you do if you had significantly more money than you've requested? <laughs> significantly more money than you were requested. Uh, so that's my question in effect. What are the targets of opportunity that you would like to pursue but for which current resources are insufficient? Um, well, it's interesting. Some of uh, what happened in the early days on tissue engineering there um, was a lot of investment. Um, do I need to look at that? Or, or I, can I move? I just speak into the room. There was a lot of investment uh, on the early days, great excitement, but the research and development on the companies on producing, let's say, skin, 
um, both larger than reimbursement. So it, it, it really outstrip uh, both uh, the money can come back. And we had to be real in a sense that to try to develop the product at the same time as the um, process. Process and product should be developed at the same time and to have a product that will be robust and cheaper so the reimbursement and regulations can be overcome. And at the moment, this is where the field is trying to address. There were many companies that had a lot of money, uh, but they didn't um, fulfill the expectations. And uh, the, the investor wanted the money back. It didn't come back in that respect. Now, if we are able to develop a product which is easy to develop, and the Ford company, the cars, the most exciting company, that's how it started with a little thing and grew and grew and grew and different parts of it, um, it was uh, divided into it. So we weren't used to that. We were used to having lots of money and spending all that and then nothing for what we were expecting to. Hopefully we'll learn. We never learn. <laughs> Here's a question that's related to uh, costs in a way here. Our daughter uh, and husband are soon to, are, her daughter and husband are soon to have a baby, and they were told of saving the cord blood for possible stem cell use. It says, it's expensive to do this. What are your thoughts about this? Um, there are many companies that they offer to collect. There is no harm if you want to spend the money, but they cannot guarantee that they will be successful. The only success is for uh, blood disorders. The others hasn't been proven efficiently. But you're not killing anybody by collecting. You're emptying your pocket. So if you want to spend money, maybe it's okay. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of what other applications might be possible here, uh, do you see stem cells as aiding in brain regeneration as a memory loss in Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, I need that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it would be nice. Not yet. That's yet. Not yet. Maybe one day. One day. Okay. Uh, here's another question that, that has to do with uh, basically the, how the research is conducted. Uh, are you aware of how many Americans are in Britain doing stem cell research, uh, having left the USA because of legal prohibitions? Um, I'm friendly with Roger Pedersen that left California. I'm not sure, I'm not very sure if he left um, because of the mega regulation, because he left just the moment he derived the cells. So um, more of the, uh, he was already in, in and in, he could come back to California now. Um, so I don't know. I don't know many. There are some, but not many. There are some, but not many. But the problem in, in in the UK, uh, fantastic country, has a great vision, uh, has a per permissive thing. I think it's an illusion because there is no money. So we should combine the Americans and the English. We speak the same language. <laughs> it's another question. Uh, with all the achievements in cell therapy, who will be the first recipients of these therapies? And what criteria will be employed in selecting the recipients? I would imagine, but you know, it's just a speculation, that um, bone marrow stem cells will be first in the clinic before the embryonic stem cells. Uh, there are a number of clinical trials for heart disorders, mostly it's for acute myocardial infarct and there are, there are some for um, heart failure. The trials, the latest New England Journal of Medicine shows three double-blind control trials. One said it doesn't work, and the other, the other two said it works a little, um, early days. It probably cardiac, maybe neural, but what is likely that the bone marrow stem cells um, will be the one. 
Here's another question. How quickly will a body be able to regenerate an organ through the new process? Uh, would regenerative therapy be appropriate for someone who is very ill? Who is very ill? Um, nobody knows the mechanism of regeneration. The postulated theory is that you give the cell and maybe you give bulk, so we, you bulk up the heart, and that helps. Others said um, maybe the cells become that cell, like a myocardium. Mm -hmm. Another said uh, maybe they release um, side chemicals that helps produce new blood vessels or something. Nobody knows exactly what are the mechanisms. So by which means and how long will it take and whether it will last. All these trials are rather short term. It may be good for the short term, but it's totally unexplored field. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, is it likely that the therapies that emerge will be dependent on each person's individual cells so that it's in the nature of personalized medicine? Or is it likely to uh, take the form of therapies that can be tailored to serve a large population with a given uh, uh, instrument or uh, cell type? Well, the reason I'm asking is the former is likely cumulatively to be far more costly than the latter. Um, I think um, we know that um, individuals are individuals, they have genetic variations. And, uh, so uh, I think it will be a somewhat personalized in that respect, but it needs to be generic. Uh, we need to have a, a, an ability to have off the shelf. Uh, products that will um, really cater for the needs of a large population uh, that maybe the response could be very because we know as medics and it may be a combination of therapies as well but as medics we know not everybody responds the same way life another question here uh, can embryonic stem cells be tested for tumors and sorted good from bad? Uh, yes, it's quite a bit of literature. Um, some uh, papers said that a tumor does develop from the stem cells, and um, others said maybe um, the stem cells will be good to uh, regenerate when the tumor is, is the area is still uh, being explored. It's a lot of interest on that. Okay. Not definitive answers. Okay. So give you somewhat of an idea of the, the diversity of our audience here. Uh, do you uh, know about stem cell technologies that are developed in Russia? It turns out we have a, a Russian MD in our audience here. <laughs> I think we need to be we need to be very careful with uh, not to go the route of uh, gene therapy when it got discredited. And it was unjust, it was very unjustifiable because it has a great potential. So no hide and um, let's have hope. So there are places um, in, uh, in the world, in Thailand or Russia, Barbados and others, they offer um, cell therapy. Um, but nobody can really find out exactly what it is they're given. Uh, I don't think they'd be casualty, but will they work? Uh, people that they do see your signs, they say, don't waste the money, but, you know, it's the start. Mm -hmm. But the U.S. They wouldn't do it, and the U.K. wouldn't do it. Either. Okay. Uh, how does aging and telomere shortening relate to regenerative capacity of stem cells? Well, it relates enormously because um, the, if the cells are aged, and this is why, and the telomeres are short, this is why uh, bone marrow stem cells have great clinical applications, but they have the problem that they aged. The pluripotent stem cells are use, a continuous source of use. So none of the cell types are perfect. They all have pros and cons, and that's one. Okay. 
The stem cells are needed where the microenvironment is damaged in humans. How do the stem cells continue to differentiate into functional cells when the microenvironment is damaged itself? Nobody knows. Nobody knows the mechanism. It could be that the cytokines, the damage, encourages the cells to continue growing and uh, differentiate. Nobody knows. It could be that they kill them. Nobody has demonstrated with certainty that they are totally alive, that they continue, they proliferate, they do the function in a very systematic way. Okay. Here's a fairly personal question. Uh, 22-year-old daughter has Crohn's disease, kept in remission by lots of drugs. Uh, is there any predictions as to whether her damaged intestines can be healed by replacement in the future? There is a lot of research on local stem cells in the gut, and people have uh, produced, um, have engineered pieces of gut, but it's early days, not for clinical applications as far as I'm aware, not yet. But there is a lot of data. Okay. Uh, you mentioned in your talk that no study has been done on uh, what type of stem cell is best for regenerative applications. Is why has no study been done on this? It's pretty impossible to organize. I mean, the problem is we have very, very backwards techniques, although we are uh, uh, and the four frontiers, it takes a long time to differentiate themselves to have a, clinic, a single clinical um, application with lots of uh, patients or animals on that and use up the enormous amount of different cell types they are. It could be an international collaboration, but then you need to have it in the same laboratory, in the same condition. This doesn't seem to be difficult task, but maybe somebody with a lot of drive will do it. <laughs> one last question here. I, I think this is probably one that many people in the audience have been thinking about. Uh, do you think we'll be able to regenerate youth? <laughs> It'd be nice. <laughs> 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 you can tint your hair. <laughs> you can wear contact glasses. <laughs> yeah. It's not necessary. Well, thank you very much. Uh, once again, for a wonderful talk. And we will, we will be reassembling about 1 o'clock to hear from Dr. Aaron. <laughs>